Welcome to our review on maintaining biodiversity. So we've had a look at obviously how we lose biodiversity, how we can increase biodiversity. So the last thing we need to consider is really how we maintain this biodiversity. So in order to actually try to do this, we need cooperation both locally and internationally, because what we need to do is preserve habitats and preserve individual species. And it's not just one man's job. It's got to be a much bigger picture here. Just some of the things that we can see on the screen there at the moment are just ways that we've got these threats to biodiversity that can be controlled through local and international cooperation. So obviously in the top left there, we've got various things that people can buy using animals as part of them. So things like the sort of shells of turtles, for example. In the bottom left, you can see the fact that sometimes people actually smuggle live birds under their trousers on planes in order to try to trade them. A baby tiger cub in the middle there being smuggled in a suitcase. That's not a stuffed toy, unfortunately. Bottom right is just showing you how they've put birds inside bottles in order to transport them again for the trade in pets, etc. And then on the right, just a few more artifacts that we can get from animals that are now becoming endangered because they're being hunted and poached for various parts of their body to be sold as souvenirs and trinkets. So one of the steps we can take here is to have international agreements. Now, what we've actually got are a few international organisations which will help secure these agreements between nations around the world. So one of these is the IUCN, and they publish something called the Red List. Now, this is a list that has all of the species on there and lists them as to whether they're endangered, critically endangered, extinct, etc. And it will inform countries about which species need conservation. The next one that we've got is CITS, so the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna. And this is all about regulating the international trade of plants and animals and the products associated with them. Now, one thing that happened as the result of the Rio Earth Summit back in 92 was that these Rio conventions came about. And they require countries, number one, to develop strategies for sustainable development. So this is the idea that if you cut down a tree, then you plant another one in its place. Secondly, to reduce greenhouse emissions, which, as we know, is still an ongoing battle across the world and to combat desertification as well. The overall aim of these is to maintain this biodiversity. And this was something that brought together these world leaders who then signed up to attempt to do this across the world. However, it's not just internationally. We need to think locally as well. So what we find is we've got different local agreements where individual countries have actually come up with their own ideas. So what we've got are different schemes within the borders of that country to try to maintain biodiversity. For example, in England, we have stewardship schemes whereby farmers get offered payments to conserve the landscape rather than farming on it. There are also different things that local councils will do. So things like trying to graze different species on different areas of grassland to make actually increase the biodiversity there as well. So we see a lot of that down around the White Cliffs in Dover, where we've got a range of different species that are grazed on the land there as well at different points. The next one is kind of a double edged sword. It's all about tourism. Now, as we know, tourism is going to bring large amounts of money to an area. Now, that money can be used to extend and improve habitats, to prevent poaching and hopefully maintain biodiversity. However, when you have large numbers of tourists coming into an area, there is also the risk of loss of biodiversity because tourists are not always the best people when they're on holiday. It seems some people take a holiday of kind of their rights and responsibilities, really. Now, obviously, what we find is one of the key examples are some of the issues we see on coral reefs. Obviously, it's not just down to humans. There are other factors at play as well. But all too often when you're away and you do go on snorkeling trips, you may well notice there's that person in the party who breaks off a piece of the coral, which has taken many years to grow to take home as a souvenir. Or one of the sadder stories that I heard in the news last year is in the picture in the bottom right there where you had these tourists in Spain who found a baby dolphin just off the coast there. And so they passed it round to have pictures taken. 
Now, the people there are actually the wildlife rescuers who tried to get there to rescue this baby dolphin, but it died because of tourists taking selfies once more. Now, one way that we can try to combat this and still have the joy of tourism is through this process of ecotourism. So this one is to try to ensure that the tourism isn't having a negative impact on the natural environment or the local communities. So how does this ecotourism thing work? Basically, a few key things. Firstly, we're going to keep tourists to certain areas. We're not going to give tourists free reign over absolutely everything. Secondly, we try to keep them to footpaths rather than allowing them to trample over anything and everything without knowing what's under their feet. And thirdly, we're going to try to avoid disturbing any breeding grounds. And the key part of it is that you only leave footprints where you go. However, there are some negative impacts associated with this as well. So if we're using just certain footpaths and tracks, then those repeated use of those trails could contribute to soil erosion. If you go to Mexico, one of the amazing experiences you can have is to actually swim with the whale sharks who come down there for their feeding and breeding purposes. However, the picture you can see in the bottom right there gives you an idea of the problems of this as well. While we do have the companies that are taking that money to hopefully put back into preserving the whale sharks, then unfortunately you can see the sheer number of boats with the one whale shark in the foreground there. So this is something that's become more popular in recent years. So now these poor whale sharks are dwarfed by all these boats racing around. And then as one passes by, you have this flood of tourists jump into the water. So it's something that still needs work. In terms of the steps you can actually take to be this responsible eco-tourist in the future, you can do some real basic things that your hotel is going to encourage you to do, hopefully saving energy and saving water so rather than getting a new towel every single day which let's face it how many of us do that at home why do it on holiday so a few things like that are going to have a big impact on the local area making sure that we're recycling things not just throwing it in the bin because virtually everyone now recycles at home so why not when we're on holiday as opposed to buying any of these mass-produced things buy local trades instead making sure that the only thing that we are taking away are memories and photographs and that we are only leaving our footprints. So not being those tourists that I've seen fishing starfish out and leaving them to dry on a sunbed because that's a souvenir apparently. Making sure that you are honouring those local traditions as well. So make sure you're informed about the local area so you don't make a bit of a muppet of yourself. And obviously some hotels are actually trying to do things like this in the bottom right there you can see a whole load of little turtle eggs. So sea turtles actually nest in a large number of the beaches around Mexico. And unfortunately, they lay their eggs all around the sun lounges as well. They have no regard for the tourists whatsoever. But we don't want tourists trampling on the eggs. So the hotel I stayed at there, they actually had their lifeguards, surprisingly, go down and they would actually remove the eggs from the nests on the beach where the tourists were and take them to the safe zone of their turtle hatchery at the other end. So they were all protected and then the baby turtles, once they hatched, were free to get back into the water. So there are steps that can be taken to promote this ecotourism. Hopefully at the end of this review, you can now explain why the local and national agreements are actually needed to maintain biodiversity and you can explain how ecotourism can help with maintaining biodiversity as well.